Many games have tried to take on the Beast, that is the Elder Scrolls series, and many have failed. Even with a well-known series, experienced studios and publishers, this can be a challenge. Does that mean they were bad games? Or were they just victims of bad timing? Dark Messiah of Might and Magic Elements, wow, that's a mouthful, was released in 2006 on PC and Xbox 360. It was developed by Arcane Studios, yes, that Arcane Studios, and published by Ubisoft. With credentials like that, you would think this would have been a home run, right? Well, on PC, it received a 72, but on 360, it received a 52. Ouch. It was praised for its great combat and being beautiful to look at, but was criticized for, and I quote, poor non-human combat and bugger all story. And if you're beautiful to look at and have some semblance of a story, don't forget to like and subscribe for more OK Gaming. You know when you leave a game on the menu for a while, it goes into a cutscene of the gameplay, giving you a taste of what's to come? Dark Messiah takes this a little further by playing an entire epic trailer, advertising the game that you've already bought. After that, we're given the choice of four classes, and we pick a difficulty which not only dictates the combat, but also limits how many life potions we can carry. We play as Sarath, and the game begins with the mysterious voice of Master Fenric, giving us instructions to find a crystal at a temple of Ashen. Go now and find the crystal. Once we find the crystal, we meet up with Fenrig again, and he tells us to go to a city called Stonehelm to help another wizard named Menelag search for an elusive artifact called the Skull of Shadows. I know, so many names to remember. Fenrig doesn't want us to go alone though, so he summons a guardian to go with us. What is your bidding, my master? One can travel lighter than two, Sarah. Am I to protect this boy? Not in that dress, sweetheart. Anyway, this is Zana, and she's apparently living in our head now. Shh. By the way, my name is Zana. We get to Stonehelm and have to help the soldiers defend against ghouls. And even get to use a ballista to take down a cyclops. You did it. I'd hug you if I could. After the battle, we meet with Menelag and his niece Liana, who Zana doesn't seem too impressed with. You worry about the expedition. You're in charge of it, after all. Of course, Uncle. Good night. And to you too, Sarah. Please don't tell me you find that sort of thing cute. We're told that we shall set sail to continue our search for the artifact the following morning. We're abruptly woken in the night, with necromancers swarming the city, trying to steal the crystal. And find Menelag fatally injured while trying to fight off a necromancer. You Uncle! 
No. No! <laughs> We chase the thieving ghoul, only to find them underground with the necromancer who is trying to open a portal to the necromancer's city. We steal the crystal back and escape. Now let's get out of here before anyone notices. Sarath has a dream about the meeting with Fenrig from earlier, except the dialogue is different, more menacing. Right now, he's looking for an artifact called the Skull of Shadows for reasons of his own that are doomed to fail. He thinks you're going to help him, the fool. At least not without this, the Shantiri crystal that we retrieved. However, boy, I don't trust you out there alone. I need someone to hold your leash. But is this the real conversation? Or one created in Sarith's mind? One can travel lighter than two, Sarah. Don't worry. You'll learn to enjoy the pain. Zana even takes on a demonic appearance and attacks Sarah. What does all this mean? The whole first part is typical gaming fare, showing us how to get around the world combat mechanics we have and how to use our inventory and abilities. We have standard heavy and light attacks, but we can also do jump attacks, power attacks, and rage attacks, which use adrenaline to execute. We can also throw items at enemies, which is always funny. There are little environmental puzzles in each area, like having to cut down a wooden stand and make barrels fall on an enemy, or moving boxes to certain places in order to reach new areas. There are little collectibles we can find in levels too, which is always a fun little side thought. There's also a night vision style ability which is limited use, but can help us get through dark areas a little easier. There are also other abilities unlocked later in the game. The enemies vary from soldiers to ghouls. And we even get mini boss fights. Just because. The levels were never too hard to work through. They were quite linear yet open so you could wander off and be a loot goblin, but you were blocked from straying too far from the quest area. The skill tree was more of a line, and we don't get to choose our skills. The next one just unlocks. We can change up our weapons and armor, and hotkey items and abilities we need instant access to, but that seems to be the extent of the customization. For a 17-year-old game, this still looks good and plays quite well. Of course, there were janky moments, but overall it had the feeling of a solid game, even if the story was a little full-on at first. We even get a voiced player character, which is a rare sight even by today's standards. We don't get dialogue choices though, so we're just moving along with the story. This is good and bad as choices offer a player a more personal approach to a game. But at the same time, if there's no real consequence for a positive or negative dialogue choice, is it worth offering empty variety? The sound and music set the atmosphere, and the voice acting isn't horribly over the top or cringy. You there, stay your business. I'm the envoy from Master Fenrir, with a message for the wizard Menelag. That's Lord Menelag. Got any proof? That's We're a little it. wary of strangers these days. I have a letter of introduction. Let me see it then. Hmm. 
by special request of Lord Menelai. And there's a seat. Let me welcome you to Stonehelm. We'll stable your horse for you if it pleases you, sir. Of course. Can you tell me where to find Menelag? Certainly, sir. You go uphill past the Golden Rivet and... Sweet Dragon's Blood, what's that? It's a hefty 10 to 13 hours, so you're getting quite a good little adventure. I think the only thing that would let it down is the info dump of a story that's forced on you if you're not familiar with the universe, and the amount of characters we have to keep track of within the first hour of play. Interestingly, Arcane were planning to make a sequel to their action RPG Arx Fatalis but due to bad sales, we're finding it hard to get a publisher. Ubisoft jumped in and offered Arcane an opportunity to work on their Might and Magic series. And so, Arx Fatalis 2 became Dark Messiah. So why does no one really talk about this game? It has all the markings of a classic, it had good studios behind it, and it plays like any other game of the time but I never see it on people's favorite RPGs lists or hidden gems. I think timing had a strong part to play. Dark Messiah came out in October of 2006, and a little game called Elder Scrolls Oblivion came out in March of the same year. Dark Messiah felt like it was ahead of its time if compared to Morrowind, which came out four years prior but it wasn't enough to take on the newest in the Elder Scrolls series. Oblivion had so much more to offer. Classes and character customization, side quests and fleshed out NPCs, endless exploring and tons of mischief to get up to. Dark Messiah didn't really stand a chance against Elder Scrolls, but now, years later, we can look at the games that were overlooked back in the day. We can appreciate what they were trying to do, what mechanics they were testing out, and not compare them to bigger game releases that may have left them in their shadow. This was fun! Let's do it again sometime! And if you like what you saw, don't forget to subscribe and leave a like down below.